Well, thank you all for coming today on this Resurrection Sunday. This is probably one of my favorite time of the year when everybody talks about the resurrection. People encourage their relatives, come and be in church. And I appreciate you being here today because this is important time, very important time. For the next four weeks, I will be doing additional. This is a beginning of the series today, and it's called Stepping Into Your Purpose. Stepping into your purpose. So we want you to be here because this is going to be something you need to hear. Now, we have been given a mandate from the Lord that he intends for us to continue to talk about us as a growing church. We're a growing church. And he said, what's important is if you're getting something from the Lord, encourage somebody to come and be a part of this. A growing church, praise God. And it's going to benefit you because we're under this mandate for 90 days to talk about it, think about it, have the attitude about it. And God's getting the blessing. He's getting anointing on us because he's getting the, the praise for making things happen. We thank you all for being here today. And let's pray and we're beginning the word today. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you thanks and praise. At this moment, Father, we trust you for the work of God to be released in this place. We thank you, Father, for the miracle working inside of each of us that we receive your spirit today. We thank you for the resurrection. We thank you that we're participating in this. And we give you praise, Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you bless this word. Father, use me, my mind, my will, my emotion, every part that it be all of you and none of me. And we trust you, Father, for a miracle in this word today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Open your Bibles this morning to Hebrews chapter 12. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12. For those that don't have a Bible with you, or if you're uh, not quite quick enough, sometimes it go kind of fast, it'll be on the screen behind me. So Hebrews chapter 12, we're going to start in verse 1. It says, therefore, we also, since we surrounded, we, were, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily ensnare us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus... Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, enduring the cross, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now that's the entire Easter message right there. But that would be too easy to stop there. I think today we need to go a little further. Because it says, run the race. Run the race. Run the race that is set before us. Run the race. This leaves a whole lot of questions to some people. What exactly is the race? Well, we're going to get to that. But run the race that is set before us and not give up. If you've ever been a racer, you've ever seen people race, there comes a place in racing when you kind of have to go through a wall. It's kind of like you're running and you're like, okay, that's it. All right, I'm done. I quit. I quit. I've seen people on races and they do the best they can, but they get up against that wall and it's like, wow, that's, an, that's it. I've had it. It's enough. But I've seen people come out of the stands and actually go down and run alongside the track and encourage the racer. You can do it. Come on. You can do it. And they finish the race because of the encouragement. This is so important. There is a race set before us. Now, this is a metaphor. If you know what a metaphor is, that means it's in representation of something else. But this metaphor, there's a race set before us. You need to see this. Most Bible scholars believe that this just means the life that you're living. There's a race set before us. Make sure you run the race. You know, you could sit in the stands and you could say, I was at the race. Or you can get in the race and say, I finished the race. <laughs> now, it's very important. Our eternal life with Christ is the finish line. Yes. You got to be in the race to get to the finish line. Amen. God wants us to get to the finish line. In, in other words, he wants us to hear, like it says in Matthew 25, it gets to verse 23 and says something like this. It says, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to hear that. I want to hear that when I get to heaven. There's a space between now and and the finish line. And that's what we're talking about. It's a place called destiny. It's a place called purpose. It's a place that's going to play out here on this earth. Destiny means something that a person is destined to do. Something they're supposed to accomplish. 
Something that has been set apart for them, a specific purpose that they're to fulfill. Now the word purpose is a reason for which something is done or which something is created. A purpose is the reason for which something exists. Now, knowing those two, we have to understand while we're here on this earth at this moment, we were all called to accomplish something. Many people say, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I understand that. But we're called to accomplish something. And this is where it's going to be played out. Our lives are not an accident. Our lives are not just kind of transcending through life with no reason, no purpose. Your life has a specific purpose. Your life has a specific reason. You were called on purpose. And then we're going to dig into this a little more because today I want you to understand the title of this sermon is called Run Toward Your Destiny. Run Toward Your Destiny. And we're going to start today with John chapter 20 and let's look at verse 1. John chapter 20. Amen. John chapter 20 and verse 1. Again, we're talking about the resurrection. Look what it says here. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene, she went down to the tomb early and while it was still dark, and she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. She saw that. And she ran and came to Simon Peter's house and to the other disciple. Now, in the book of John, whenever John refers to himself, he does it in the third person. He says, the disciple that Jesus loved. In other words, he could tolerate all the rest of them, but he loved me. And so he calls himself that disciple that Jesus loved. All the time he calls himself that in the book of John. So look at this. He came and she came and ran to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus, Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. And Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and they were going to the tomb. So they both ran together. Let me say it again. So they both ran together. All right, everybody say it with me. So they both ran together. Now that's important to understand. They both ran together. And the other disciple outran Peter. And now Peter was a little slower than John. John wanted to make sure you knew that. And so John got to the, temp, to the tomb before Peter did. So when, when they got to the tomb, the other disciple outran him. That's what it says here. And Peter came to the tomb. And then... He stooping down, looked in. He stooping down, but he did not go in. And so looking down, he saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came and followed him and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen clothes lying there. And the handkerchief that had been around his head, it was not lying with the linen clothes, but it was folding, kneaded together and put, placed by itself. And then the other disciple, that's John, the other disciple who came to the tomb first, wanted to make sure you didn't miss that part, and he came to the tomb first, he also went in and he saw and he believed. Now this is an important scripture because it signifies some very important things that happen with Jesus Christ. Now look at this. If we're going to run towards our destiny, run toward your destiny, that's talking about you're not supposed to stroll, you're not supposed to walk, you're not supposed to meander, you're not supposed to wander, you're just supposed to run towards your destiny. And the woman, now there are a, a couple of women according to other scriptures but the women came down and they went to the tomb because they were adding respect to Jesus they were trying to pay homage to their master who was now gone the leader had left them they did not go down to the tomb expecting there to be some kind of resurrection if they'd known there's going to be a resurrection they would not have left him because they would have said, he's going to be coming out soon, let's just hang out. Yeah, yeah. But they left him. They went and hid out. They hid out. Now, we ascribe to the word resurrection because you know the rest of the text. You're privy to all the information that he rose from the dead. In fact, that's something you've seen signs and symbols everywhere. He is risen, he is risen. We know that, but in that day, they did not know that. They did not know he was going to rise from the dead. Even though he told them, they didn't know. They didn't as ascribe to the words that were spoken out of his mouth. They did not know that he would rise from the dead. 
Now, if they had a, a, expected that, that he was going to rise three days later, like I said, they wouldn't have left him. Now, it wasn't the magnitude, it wasn't the magnitude of their faith that drew them down to the tomb, but it was their love. It was the love for Christ. The magnitude of their faith had nothing to do with it. It was the fullness of the love of, of Christ himself and what he had done. They'd seen way too many things. They went down there to the tomb bringing the incense and the frankincense and the myrrh. This is burial uh, fragrances that you put upon a body that's been deceased. That's because after a few days, just like Lazarus, behold, he stinketh. And so they went down there, they were going to anoint his body so that they, there could be a, a better aroma. And believe me, write this down if you're taking notes. There are some things in life that need to be aromatized because they stinketh. Are you with me? So this is something very important. Now, the women came down there with heavy hearts. They came down there with tear-stained eyes. They got down to the tomb. They were going to memorialize the master. And when they saw the stone rolled away, Mary declared, the master is gone. The master is gone. Very sad point. Now there's something really important. It's very glorious. Because when people love you like this, when they love you and it's not fickle love, when they love you, really love you, when it's not just uh, love that's conditional based on what's going on right now, but they really love you, that's very important. Like it says in Matthew 22, you get to verse 37, says it like this. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. He said, this is the way you're supposed to love. If you love anyway, you're supposed to love like this. And he said, I want you to love like this. There's a few people in your life, I'm talking about from cradle to grave, there's a few people that really are going to love you unconditionally. And if they do, you're blessed. You're really blessed. Because that's a rarity. It's a minority. You meet thousands of people in your life. But the people that stick with you through everything, no matter what's going on, no conditions involved, they're the ones you really love because they're blessing you by loving you back. They really love you. They really love you. Listen, anybody can love when you're up. Oh, yeah, they can love you good when you're, you know, when you get a promotion in your job. Oh, yeah, we love you. <laughs> you got a, a check in the mail. Hey, we're, we love you. We love you. You just got a new yacht for the first time. Oh, yeah, we really love you. <laughs> we love you. Let's go for a ride. They, they love you. But you can really tell who loves you when things are not going good. All hell breaks loose and you're in big trouble. If they stand by your side and hold you up and lift you up no matter what, these really love, these are folks that love you. They really love you. When you're no longer a winner in their eyes, but they still stand by you, boy, they love you. These are the ones when it doesn't pay to love you, but they love you anyway. Because see, most people, most people need some kind of uh, uh, retribution. They, they want some kind of retaliation for their love to you. They want something back from, from what you've got. But those that love you unconditionally, I'm talking about those that always love you no matter what. That's very rare because most people love you and when they don't find it advantageous to love you anymore, they withdraw. They no longer see it as a payment that you're going to help them, but they want to get away. And you probably have experienced this in your life. Folks that are there and then they're gone because it's no longer advantageous for them to love you anymore. And they walk away. And the reason is they have lost the benefit. They can't see a benefit for loving you anymore. You know, I, I can't help but wonder... Jesus is going to raise from the dead. He told everybody he's going to raise from the dead. They had this trial. They had this hanging. They put him on the cross and they threw him in a tomb. And you'd think that some people would have come for the graveside service. I mean, like it says in Matthew 14, Jesus fed 5,000 people. I, I, my question, where are those 5,000 people? They didn't come to the to the 
to the hanging. They, they didn't come to the, the graveside service. They're nowhere to be found. Jesus gave them bread. He, 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 broke, the, he broke the bread and fish and fed 5,000 men plus the women and children. You'd think that they say, we saw the man of miracles. They'd want to be there, but they weren't nowhere to be found. Wow. In Mark chapter 4, there was a woman with the issue of blood. She'd been sick 12 years. She, no, she was sick, man. She, she was bleeding. Nothing could happen good for this woman. But Jesus, walking through the crowd, she crawled through and touched the hem of her garment, and the hem of his garment. She was healed. And he said, who touched me? He already knew. Man, this woman finally confessed it was me. Where was this woman? She wasn't there at the graveside service wasn't there at the tomb. She wasn't there. And in John chapter 4, there's a woman at the well. This Sumerian woman, he knew that she'd been married a bunch of times and people she was even with now. It wasn't even her husband. And, and he knew this, but he still led her into the fullness of God and said, this is what you do if you, if you would drink from the well of the water of life. That's me. You'll never thirst again. But she didn't show up. She wasn't there. In Mark 10 was blind Bartimaeus. He called from a distance, said, Jesus, Master, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus laid his hands on him and healed him. He didn't show up. You say, where are all these people? As a matter of fact, I just talked about Lazarus, and that's mentioned in John chapter 11. Lazarus was raised from the dead. Jesus showed up. He'd been dead. He said, roll the stone away. Lazarus got out of the tomb because he called him out. He said, Lazarus, come out. But Lazarus didn't show up at his tomb. Isn't that funny? It's really odd and kind of amazing. You can pour yourself into folks that never pour themselves back into you. Wow. Wow. These are the kind of people, listen, they suck the life out of you anytime they see that you've got something going on. They draw from you and draw from you and draw from you. But the moment it doesn't seem advantageous to them, they walk away. They're there for a while in your life. It seems like they'll always be there, but they're there as long as they find an advantage and they're gone. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it gets to verse 7, says it like this. It says, love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things and goes on the same verse says love never fails. Love, 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 love. I've been talking about love. Now we're talking about real love, real love, real love. This is the kind, real love, not infatuation. Everybody have been through that, I'm sure. <laughs> you get infatuated with somebody, it's like, ooh, I love that. No, you're just infatuated. <laughs> but this, I'm talking about real love. Real love is not like infatuation. It's not like puppy love. It's not like dribbling with your emotions, hanging off the edge of a building. It's, well, I'm talking about an expression of yourself, listening to the fullness of love. That's the love that's in your heart. Love is more than lasciviousness. Love is more, it's always in the mood to give. Love wants to help even when it's been hurt. Love wants to give even when it feels like it's being used. Love's willing to help. And you say, well, I don't want to love like that. Jesus did. Even when they mocked him, pulled his beard, shamed him, put him on the cross, buried him in the tomb. He didn't have anything to say but forgive him, Father. They don't know what they do. I think sometimes we need to see real love like that because love is passionate. Love is bodacious. This kind of love that he's talking about, it's not just there when you're winning. It's there even when you're losing. This is the kind of love that is always stays even when the thrill is gone. I'm talking about we'll lift you up and help you and push you through even when it's not advantageous. Love, love just keeps on giving. 5,000 didn't come, blind Bartimaeus didn't come, the woman at the well didn't come. But here comes these women, a few what I call stragglers. <laughs> here come these stragglers. they just heading on down to the tomb. Here come these stragglers. Listen, if you in your life have a few people that really love you the way these women love Jesus, you're blessed. You are really blessed. Can you see him coming down to the tomb? Heavy heart, tear-stained eyes. 
And yet they're still coming down there. They're coming down there. Even though they've been thinking, we lost him. We lost him. We lost the very master of miracles. We lost him. We lost him. It's been 400 years since we've had any kind of real religion to stand with us. They've been against us. People have been against us. The prophetic word stopped 400 years ago. We don't have anything to stand on until Jesus showed up. We have nothing to worship in the manner that God is all God. He's all knowing and he's always there. We didn't have any of that for 400 years. Now Jesus shows up for 33 years. We're fascinated by his miracles and what he can do and how he helps people. He's so wonderful. And now the master's gone. The master's dead. He is dead. They get down to the tomb. They say, you know, it's a good thing to go down there because he was the master of miracles and he gave us hope. He gave us hope. You know, after all 400 years of not having hope, all of a sudden when hope shows up, it says it in Isaiah chapter 40, it gets to verse 31. It says it like this, Isaiah 40, 31. It says, but those whose hope is in the Lord, they renew their strength. They mount up with wings like eagles. <laughs> they can run <laughs> and not get weary. They can walk and not faint. It's talking about this is the kind of thing that happened because the Lord shows up. He gives you the power to run. He says, I'm going to help you run toward your destiny. I'll give you the strength to run and get there. I'll give you the power to have strength in your whole life once again. He gave us power to run. But now the hope is gone. Now when hope is gone, if hope is there, it makes you strong. But when hope is gone, it makes you weary. Yes. You know, when your hope fades, it almost drops your shoulders a full couple inches. You straggle, you struggle, and you walk slow because the hope that you once were counting on has now vanished. Jesus, their Savior, is gone. And the woman, they said to one another, let's go on down to the tomb, to what's left of Jesus' body. Let's take down there some incense and some myrrh and some other stuff, and let's just be sure that we aromatize his body so that the fragrant is sweet instead of another way. Mary got to the tomb. But it's a mess. She expected something different. But the stone is rolled away. She expected it to be different, but the stone has been moved. It's been moved. Now, they pay good money for people to take care of grave sites. They pay good money to make sure that the flowers are right and everything's in neat order. You know, even in that day, they were taking care of the tombs to make sure they were good. But this tomb was completely a mess. It was all broken down. And Mary looked inside. He was not there. He was not there. And I'll take this liberty to assume a couple of things. The Bible didn't say how she went down there. But I assume she was sad. But it does say as soon as she looked in, she didn't see him. And she ran to find Peter. She ran. She ran. She came back to Peter running. She was running. Now there's some things in life, and I said earlier, there's some things in life that stink, but there's some things in life that make you run. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you, you just got to run. Certain things in life happen to you that absolutely make you pick up the pace. Are you with me? You got to run, you got to run, you got to run. You got to pick up the pace. There's no time to walk in grief. There's no time because everybody else is going crazy. There's no time to even hesitate and cry. There's no time. All this woman wanted to do was have a moment to grieve. But then she realized the body of Jesus was stolen. 
And she went running. She went running. They've taken away my Lord, she said. They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've taken him. He's the master of miracles, and I do not know where he is. And she ran up to Peter to get some help. She ran up to find Peter and the other disciple. And she ran up there and told him. She told him, the master is gone. Peter and the other disciple. Peter and the other disciple. Peter. Peter. You know, we've heard Peter's name before. In Matthew 16 and verse 18 says it like this. Jesus said, now I say unto you, you are Peter. This means rock. You are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And the powers of hell will not conquer it. He said, this is it. You are now Peter. You are a rock. You are a rock. I got excited about this because Jesus called Peter the rock, the strength, and set him apart to be that kind of rock. He taught him to be the rock of which his name represents. He said, you are Peter the rock. And he talk, taught him to be unrelenting and no matter what situation is going on. He said, every kind of pressure there is, I'm teaching you to live life with no pressure. You're a rock. You're a rock. I'm telling you, you're a rock. And he said, this is what I expect you to do. I expect you to live like a rock. And she comes to get Peter and that other disciple. And now they're all running down to the tomb. Can you see this? They're not just jogging. They're not meandering. They're not taking them time. They didn't stop to get something to eat. They went on the way down to the tomb. They're running. And they get down to the tomb because that's the last known location of Jesus. And they get down to the tomb. And as soon as Mary got to Peter, she said out of her mouth, Somebody has taken our Lord. Now with that in mind, you've got to understand, things are not as she expected. This is not what she expected. I'm taking the liberty to say this. It doesn't say it in the Bible exactly like that, but I do not believe that she knew that was going to happen. This is something that she did not expect. She was really grieved that he died. I'm telling you what, she was angry that the body was gone. She was grieving over his death, but where's my master? His body was now gone and she was completely unexpecting for this to happen. Anybody ever had something in life happen that you didn't expect? <laughs> if you've ever had something in life happen that you didn't expect, listen, I'm going to tell you something. This is important. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Linda, listen to me. <laughs> this is important. If you're going to get anything that you don't... One thing about life I do know. One thing. This one, uh, listen. One thing in life that I do know. Nothing is for sure. <laughs> I, listen, you think something's for sure on this world? Nothing's for sure. The very thing you're counting on, not going to come through. Anybody ever count on somebody come pick you up and they didn't come? <laughs> I stood at my house one day, two hours went by, they didn't show up. Three hours went by, they didn't show up. Four hours went by, my mother started saying, son, get away from the window. You're being stupid. <laughs> I stood there four more hours before I realized how stupid that was. And finally that evening, I finally got in touch with them. Because that's before cell phones. So I finally got in touch with them. I said, why didn't you come and get me? We forgot. I just talked to you every day last week. And you forgot? We forgot. All ten of you forgot? We forgot. You know, somehow, when life shoots you something unexpected, you have a whole different thing to think about. Why did they forget why did they choose to leave me there? You know, I'm sure that things like this has happened to all of us. Life often disrupts us. It, all, it often happens where you get something unexpected and it happens right in front of you. The very time, the least opportune time for it to happen, it seems to happen. There's never, let me help you. There's never a good time to have an accident. Anybody know what I'm saying? It, it, when it happens, it's not a good time. It's never a good time. But here's something that's very important. John 10.10 10 says it like this. It says the thief, he's talking about the devil, the thief 
comes, the thief comes not except for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus said, I come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Now, how important is that? That is the important part of God. You got to trust in him. You got to trust in God. You got to stand firm in every single situation. It's hard when things are not going the way you want them to go. But you got to stand in God. You got to stand. You got to stand even when things happen that you don't expect. You got to stand in God. That's the hard part. When stuff's going amok and going awry and you say, "Wow, I don't know why this has happened." But you still got to stand in God. You still got to stand in God. You got to trust God because if you don't trust God, what you're proving is you're not flexible and you're not adjustable. You're not flex. Listen, if you're going to go through this life, if you're going to make it, you got to be flexible and you got to be adjustable. Are you with me? Because flexible and adjustable means that you're going to have some change, but you still trust the Lord anyway. Amen. In Psalms, it gets to Psalms in 57 and verse 7, it says, My heart is steadfast. Then it repeats it for those that didn't get it. Oh God, my heart is steadfast. Twice he says it. I'm going to sing and praise. I'm going to give praise to God. My heart is steadfast. How important is this? My heart is steadfast. This is the power of the omniscient God. He's the God that deals with our unexpected. We go through stuff all the time. And here's something important. It takes us by surprise. It didn't take God by surprise. He already knew it was going to happen. He's already planned a way of escape. We're the only one that's surprised by this. When something happens, we go, oh, what am I going to do? And God's going, shh, shh, calm down, calm down. I already saw this. I already know. I got a way of escape. I already got this. I got this. He looks at this, it's not by surprise because he's no, he knows what's going on in every facet of your life. He already knows. You need money, he already knows. He's glad when you pray because that way you acknowledge him by saying, I acknowledge you're the only one that can get it to me. Amen. He says, you need salvation, I already know, but I'd like you to ask. The only reason is because it's just like little kids when they come up and they get their hand in the cookie jar. Wait, wait, wait. Don't get in there without asking. But you said you made them for me. I just ate 12. <laughs> That's supposed to be for the whole month. God says, I'm trying to get you somewhere. Just follow me. Nothing takes God by surprise. In Proverbs, it says in chapter 3, starts in verse 5, says it like this. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean to your own understanding. Don't try to figure it out yourself. In every way, acknowledge him. He'll make your path straight. He will direct your path. He will direct your path. One good thing, the Lord, listen, in all the commentators, it says it like this. The Lord has already ascribed to this. He said, in the direction of your path, that means I want to help you get to your destiny. I will direct your path to where you're supposed to be. How many know that's a good word from the Lord? I'll help. I'm directing you to where you're supposed to be. That leaves us so much blessing to understand. He's trying to get us there more than we want to get there. I'll direct you to where you're supposed to be. What a blessing. He says, this is important. He says it like this. Don't, don't, I, I don't want you to worry about it. I got you covered. <laughs> I got this covered. You might be shocked, but God has never been shocked. He's got you covered. When you don't know what to expect, you can expect this. He's got you covered. <laughs> He's got you covered. When you're disappointed, don't let disappointment set in. It becomes discouragement, which sets you down. It brings on all kinds of disastrous things. Just remember this. God's got you covered. God's got you covered. When you run into a mess, just like Mary did at the tomb, he's got you covered. You've got to remember, he's got you covered. God has got you covered. All of a sudden, God demands you to pick up the pace. When things are in a rush, God demands you pick up a pace. He says, pick up the pace. Pick up the pace. If you don't pick up the pace, you're going to be left behind. 
you're going to be left behind. And I am truly amazed by people that cannot pick up the pace. Doesn't that shock some of you? I am so surprised when, when people are meandering through their life and you say, come on, get, get with it right now. And they go, what's the hurry? Life is moving faster than you are. I am truly amazed that some people cannot pick up the pace. They're in a rut. They're in a rut. They do this. I think I'll just stroll over here. Oh, well, this isn't what I want. I think I'll just stroll back where I was. <laughs> <laughs> well, this doesn't seem to be working for me. I think I'll just stroll over here. And they keep strolling back and forth and they never get anywhere. And you wonder, can't you get your life together? Because they won't pick up the pace. In a disaster, in a crisis, it's amazing. Everyone that's involved has got to pick up the pace. When you're dealing with the crises, come on, anybody ever dealt with the crises? If you've dealt with the crises, you've got to pick up the pace. Sometimes they give you a notice in the mail that says, I want you to respond. And it's been going through the mail sometimes for four or five days. And it finally shows up and it says, before Friday, they sent it on Monday. You got it on Saturday. <laughs> yes. Listen, it'll make some people kind of weary in their mind, but you've got to pick up the pace. You've got to handle things quickly. You've got to handle things. You have got to see when crisis sets in, I've seen some emergency situations where people see the crises coming and there's rescue attempts from emergency vehicles and they're in a rescue pace and they're going at a fast and a, and a furious race and they're trying to get folks out of danger and they're moving so quickly and many people are working around the clock and they're setting themselves up to deal with this crisis. We were in a crisis a couple of years ago. Let me explain. It might not have been a disaster for everybody, but for us it was. It seems like we were traveling back from a minister's convention just a couple of years ago in January. And we were flying at a great airline. And we were flying. And we, we checked in a couple hours early. We were good. Everything was great. And weather got in climate. It got so in climate, they began to cancel airlines after airline and plane after plane. Because where they were landing was covered with water. Rain was coming down so hard, the planes couldn't even get down to the airport. We're talking about rain, rain, rain. We're talking torrential rain. It was pouring down rain. Hundreds of planes were canceled. Ours was too. We ran to the desk and said, you've got to help us. Get us on another plane. Now, some people were acting angry and acting bitter. You know, the people behind the counter were not in charge of the weather. <laughs> now, some of you didn't know that, but they, they didn't make that weather happen. They were trying to help them. They were trying to help them. People were typing frantically. People were moving their fingers at 100 miles an hour. Folks were running through the airport trying to find new planes, going to another destinations that were allowing them to land. We finally found a plane. We had to run to find to get on the thing. And they took us to a whole different destination that we never intended. And they couldn't get us out of there because the rain had started. <laughs> And we were stuck in this weird destination. All these people that were on this flight, all those hundreds of planes that had been bounced all over the nation, and we were stuck in this airport. And everybody was drenched from going from one airport and one terminal to the next, drenched, totally drenched with torrential rains. And, and we were so sad. But our spirits, we prayed. And we said, Lord... Encourage us. We build ourselves up in you. We would not criticize the handlers. We would not criticize the typers. And all the people from the planes were sleeping in the airport, laying down everywhere in the airport. We walked up to the lady and we said, we know it's not your fault what had happened, but you're doing the best you can. Is there any way you can get us a room we don't want to sleep in the airport. And the lady said, you know, we've got hundreds of people that are out here. There's hundreds, hundreds of hundreds of people doing this. I know. Is there anything you could do? Well, let me make a call. Okay, call somebody. <laughs> 
And she makes a call, and she goes, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. She on hunt for quite a while. And finally, she came back and said, okay, they're going to give you a room. We have this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. I said, which one's the best hotel? She said, this one. I said, put us in that one. <laughs> All the other people sleeping at the airport. And they put us on a little shuttle and took us over to this really nice place. We had a nice shower. We got in a nice bed. They brought us back to the airport in the morning. Because crises has to be handled. You can't move into the crises. You have to move into the spirit. Just like Jesus, when he moved into the spirit, Mary was there. She had to move into the spirit. Peter and John, they had to move into the spirit. And this is very important. Very important. I don't need people that can't deal with the crises around me. How about you? If there's going to be a problem, I need somebody that can pick up the pace. Let's do it. Let's make this happen. And I'm so glad when God puts people around me that are willing to pick up the pace. I'm thankful. In Psalms 119 and verse 32, it says it like this. I will run the way of your commandments. I will run. I will run. I will run. When you set my heart free, I will run. I will run. I will run. You know, God's encouraging us. He says you need to run toward your destiny. Run toward your destiny. Run to win. Run with a purpose. Run, run, run every step as if there's a purpose. Run to your destiny. And listen, he said, I want you to run and set your heart free. Your life has a specific purpose in God. And you want to know what your purpose is? Somebody said, could you tell me? Uh, would you want to know what your purpose is? Uh, somebody said, could you tell me? Yes, I can tell you. You'll be surprised. You say, you know my purpose? Yes. Are you ready for this? Yes. Some people say, okay, go ahead. I want to hear it. <laughs> this is a mandate from God. This is your assignment. This is your purpose. You need to run toward your destiny. God says, I want you to hear me. This is the very thing you've been called to do. Here is your purpose in life. It's to know him and make him known. Whoa. You mean it's that simple? Yeah. It's to know him and make him known. Amen. Now listen, there's all kinds of platforms that we do because life is the way it's coming at us. It's part of the purpose in God is to get to the purpose. It's how we live our life. That's the mandate from God is to know him and to make him known. That's our purpose. That's what we're supposed to do. Now, everybody, everybody's got a different call. They're drastically different. Your platform may be some office somewhere where you go every week. Your platform may be you drive a truck and people have to see you. on. The, your purpose is still to know him and make him known. You may be in the school somewhere. That does not, it does not bypass God's plan. It's to know him and make him known. You may work sometimes at the nursing home. Your job is to know him and make him known. Amen. You may say, you mean that's the purpose God laid on our hearts? Yes. yes. You may have all kinds of other destinies involved, but your purpose is to know him and make him known. Now, doesn't that make it a whole lot easier to understand your life cycle? Your life is to know him and make him known. This is where you run your race. It's to lift up your head and understand you've all been created in his image. You've been created in the image of almighty God. You have the you have the favor of God on your life. It's to know him and make him known. Run toward your destiny. In 1 Corinthians, it gets to chapter 9. It starts in verse 24. In chapter 9 and verse 24, it says it like this. It says, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. Now, this is not going to take too many people by surprise. Yeah, that's the way races are run. Everybody runs. 
Only one person gets the run, gets the prize. But then it goes on and says this, so run to win. <laughs> it doesn't say just run, just run, just do, just run to win. It says run to win. All athletes are, dis are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it to win the eternal prize. The eternal prize of this race is you getting into heaven. Oh, glory to God. This is the eternal prize. You receive Christ. So I run with purpose in every step. I run with purpose in every step. I run with purpose in every step. Steps into your purpose. I run purpose with every step. I'm not shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training to do what I should do. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself am disqualified. But he said, I want you to run. I want you to run. I want you to run. Run, 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 run. And you got to expect something. You know, when they got to the tomb, they didn't expect it to be like that. You got to expect something. You got to expect something. Oh, the dangers of low expectations. Most people live in that realm. The dangers of low expectations. I used to teach school and the kids, one, one child would tell me, he said, I, I don't want to, I don't want to expect too much. I don't expect too much. I, I, I don't expect too much. And sure enough, he lived up to his expectations. <laughs> He didn't expect much of himself and he got it. Are you with me? God's trying to tell us to get our expectors a little higher because everything is by expectation. I'd rather aim for the stars and hit the mountain than not aim at all. I'd, ra I'd rather go after it even if I don't make it. I mean, it says to run the race. I'd rather go after it and still not make I'd rather try... And fail rather than not try at all. God says, I want you to run this race. Run this race. And you can't live with the wouldas and the shouldas and the couldas. I wish it had been different. It should have been different. It could have been different. I'm going to run towards my destiny. How about you? I'm going to run towards my destiny. Run towards your destiny. Run when you're weary. Run when the good times. Run in the bad times. Run when you're alone. Run with your with friends. Run, run when your hope is good or when your hope is out. Run anyway. Run, run to win for the eternal prize. In Ephesians 5, it gets to verse uh, 15 and says it like this. Live life. Then with due sense of responsibility... Not as men who do not know the meaning and the purpose of life, but as those who do. And what is life's meaning? What is its purpose? It's to know God. It's to know Jesus and make him known. And know him and make him known. Wow. Make the best use of your time despite all the difficulties of these days. Don't be vague, but firmly grasp what you know to be the will of God. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. You got to run towards your destiny. Run towards your destiny. You got to run. You got to run. You got to run. You can't just walk. You can't just wander. You can't just wake up in the morning and say, Well, I wonder what I'm going to do today. You know, I, I think that's, a, that's kind of a waste. Might as well give your day to somebody who's going to run with a purpose. Are you with me? Amen. I particularly like those that can pick up the pace because there's so much that we can do with so little time. God says there's a whole lot of lives at stake. They're counting on us to pick up the pace. The Bible says that he's going to get the gospel spread out through all the world. And then the end comes. You know, I think we ought to do our part to spread the gospel through all the world. I mean, yeah, we talked about it today. She said all the nations that we're involved in, all the different ministries that we give to. Well, that's just a part of it. But we're a vital part too. I want to see all Bakersfield get saved. 
for heaven's sake. Yes, this is what God told us to do. Run the race. Run the race. We got to give over to destiny and planning and strategies and purpose. Because there are people. There are people that will do something with their lives. They're going to give it to Christ. They'll give it to Christ. You got to run after your destiny. Run after your destiny. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the appointed time. God says, I'm wanting you to do something with your life now because it's running time. It's running time. It's running time. It's not walking time. It's not meandering time. It's not sightseeing time. It's running time. He said, I want you to pick up the pace and run. Listen to me. You're supposed to run after your destiny. And when you run after your destiny, you automatically will distance yourself from your history. Glory to God. Anybody have a history that you don't want to go back to? <laughs> if you got one of them histories, I'm telling you, you pick up your destiny, you get away from your history. Does that make sense? God says, I want you to run after your destiny. Run, run, run. Don't spend time trying to fix the past. I've got people that say, well, you remember this, you remember that. I don't need to remember that. I'm a new me creature in Christ. All things are passed away. All things become new. I don't want to remember that. I want to think about something else. Now, Mary started to run. She got Peter and both of them started to run. John went with them and they all started to run. Peter and the other disciple, they were running. They were running. They were running. Anybody ever seem like you missed it? You know, you're, you, you, you were trying, but it didn't happen. You were doing the best you could, but didn't pull through. Here's what the Lord was kind of quickening me. He says, no matter if you've missed it, You've run short on something. Here's what I want you to determine. I'm going to run for my goal in Christ. Yes. He said, I don't care what you're dealing with. Even if you become older and you say, you know, I'm about to wind down now. You know, there's a whole lot of folks that didn't even find out what they're supposed to do with their life till they got over 60. Right. Somebody said, really? Oh, yeah, I know some people that are 65 before they even start. I know one that's 80 before he even started making his whole career serving God. Over 80 years old. Now somebody said, well, how do they do that? You've got to make up your mind, ready for this, to start running. <laughs> start running. Listen, I think what's really important is not what you did in your past. What are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? You got to start running. You got to start running. You got to start running. When do you start running? The moment you recognize you need to run. You've got to pick up the pace and start running. In Hebrews 3, it gets to verse 15. It says this. Jesus said it like this. Remember what he said. Remember. Today, when you hear his voice, harden not your hearts like Israel did when they rebelled against God. Don't let your heart get hard. Some people said, I have told people it's time to move on. And they go, well, I don't know if I can hear that right now. They're getting a hard heart. Listen, I don't care how old you think you got. I don't care how long you think you got left. I don't care how young you think you are. Life needs you. People need you. They need to hear the word. They need to hear about him. They need to give their life to him. And they need to hear from you about him. You need to give your life to him. And you need to share him. That's the goal of God. Run toward your destiny. Run toward your destiny. When the Lord gives you an opportunity to escape, you don't need to act cute. Oh, I'm so cute. You just need to run toward your destiny. God says, I'm trying to get you where you need to go. You are prepared now to match this run. You are prepared to make this run. Are you prepared? Come on, say it. I'm prepared, prepared. to make this run. He said, this is the time. You got to run toward your destiny like never before. Run toward your destiny. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray this day, we will run toward our destiny. I know, Lord God, that you raised from the dead. Other people were surprised, but this is your plan. You had this plan from the beginning. I pray that even as you rose from the dead, we can rise from where we are to be aware of our destiny. 
I pray, Lord God, that you would move on our life, move on our heart, move on us this day to follow after you. Is there someone here that would say, you know, I don't know Christ is my Savior. I don't know him. I don't understand the full empty tomb, but I do know this. Christ rose from the dead. I want to make him my Savior. If that's you and you've never received Christ before, you've never received him in your life, publicly you've never made a proclamation to receive Christ in your life, but you'd say today, I want to receive Christ to be my Savior. I want you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you. And somebody else would say, listen, I need to rededicate myself to the Lord. I know there's so much in my life going on but I need to know him and make him known. That's my purpose. I want to rededicate myself to Christ. Even this Easter, this day that he raised from the dead, I want to raise up to him and make him known. I want to make him known. Let me make him known. Would you pray for me? If that's you, I want you to raise your hand as I pray that you rededicate yourself to Christ this day. Father, in the name of Jesus, for those that would say, Lord God, help me. I have been a believer, but at this point I want to be the believer that helps make him known. I pray that my life would change, my attitude would change. I will not find myself begrudging anything. I will not find myself discouraged in anything, but I'll make him known and I give you praise for that I give you praise for that I give you praise for that